So right now at Concordia, we are in this series that is called Faith and Family, and this series is all about two of the most important things that we can ever have in our lives, one which is faith, and the other which is family. And just in case you haven't been here or this is your first time here, let me kind of give you the big idea and the bottom line of this particular series. The big idea and the bottom line is this. There is no such thing as a perfect family. Now, here's the thing. If you came from a family, or if you have a family, or if you have ever seen a family, then you already know the bottom line of this series, right? You already know that there is no such thing as a perfect family because you've experienced this before. And when families encounter struggles and troubles, every family eventually will need a little bit of help. And that's what this series is devoted to. In this series, we're taking a look at some of the common struggles and troubles that a lot of families have, and we're asking how faith can actually help us in our families. Because God makes promises to our families and he desires to give gifts for our families, God has help that can transform our families when we listen to him and when we follow him. And that's what this series is all about. And so today, as we continue our series, we're gonna be taking a look at the topic of family feuding, family fights, what to do when some family conflict comes for you. So uh, I'm the first of three kids. I have a middle sister and a younger brother. And uh, we all grew up in this 50s-style ranch home that had uh, three bedrooms. And uh, that meant that my parents, of course, they shared a bedroom. My my sister got her own bedroom. But then me and my brother, uh, we shared a bedroom growing up. And and I got to tell you that most of the time, things went fine. Uh, most of the time, but, but especially as my brother got a, a little bit older and was no longer my baby brother, but a little bit older in his years, um, he began to, um, well, he began to frustrate me sometimes because ever since I can remember, I've always been kind of a neat nick. I've lived by the motto, uh, there's a place for everything and everything in its place. Uh, my brother, on the other hand, had no such compunction about cleanliness, okay? He didn't care at all. And so he would come home after school and he'd throw his backpack in the middle of the floor and he'd you know, put socks and underwear everywhere, even all over my bed. And uh, this began to go on for a while and I got so annoyed by it that I finally decided that I was going to take matters into my own hands. And so in our bedroom, we had you know, his bed on one side and, and my bed on the other side. And so I went to the cabinet and I, and I got a roll of masking tape and uh, went, in, went into our, our bedroom, and right down the middle of our bedroom, between his bed and my bed, just did this number. Oh, yeah. Divided the bedroom in half. And um, when my brother came into our bedroom, uh, just a few minutes later, I decided I was gonna have a little conversation with him, and so I said to him, all right, I need you to listen up. And he said, okay. And I said, listen, you slob. Because, you know, it was always very kind to my brother and he didn't know I was going to be a pastor so I could say that kind of stuff to him, okay? So I said, listen, you slob, I am sick and tired of you throwing stuff all over our bedroom. So here's the new rule, here's the new deal, okay? You see this line of tape? That side is your side, this side is my side. You can do whatever you want on your side. But as soon as stuff from your side makes it over to my side, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to throw it away, okay? Okay? And I didn't even wait for him to answer because I already knew that this was the way it was going to be. I had made the rules. I had set the rules. And so there was a little bit of conflict between my brother and me. Can you relate? Have you ever had a family feud or a family fight? Have you ever had a moment where your family was in conflict? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, now to talk about this, we're going to be taking a look at a story from the first book of the Bible, uh, the Old Testament book of Genesis, and it's about one of the most famous sibling rivalries, not only in the Bible, but actually in all of human history. There are these two brothers, one whose name is Jacob, and the other whose name is Esau. And I just want to walk through and work through their story with you today, and let me just begin by setting a little bit of background. Uh, Jacob and Esau were actually fraternal twins. And so Esau was actually a little bit older than Jacob, just by a few minutes, and their parents were Isaac and Rebekah. And you need to know this about these two brothers, about these two boys. Um, Even in the womb, they were at odds with each other. 
Uh, there's this kind of interesting line in Genesis 25, verse 22, where Rebekah is pregnant, and Jacob and Esau are in her womb, and it says, the babies jostled each other within her. Now, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, and the Hebrew word for jostled is the word rasas, which carries with it a sense of crushing something or even killing someone. And so a, a lot of times you'll hear an expectant mother, right, say, oh, I felt the baby kick or I felt the baby move. Well, when Rebecca was pregnant, she could feel her baby's fights. They were resossing each other. They were brawling inside her belly. She could literally feel them almost try to crush each other or kill each other, and she knows this is not normal. And so she begins to get very concerned, and she goes to God, and she prays to God, and she says to God, God, what in the world is going on with this pregnancy? And God answers her, Genesis 25, verse 23, the Lord says to her, well, here's the problem. There are two nations that are in your womb. And there are two peoples who are within you that from within you will be separated. God says to Rebecca, okay, so you know how nations and people sometimes fight and battle and get into wars and, and even try to kill each other? Well, that's what's going to happen with your two twins. That's what's going to happen with, with, with your two sons. They're going to fight with each other. They're going to brawl with each other. They might even try to kill each other. And so God says to Rebecca, just be forewarned. I've told you ahead of time that this is what's going to happen. Now, if God was to tell me when I had like a couple of kids, okay, that my two kids were going to be especially contentious with each other, I think, and maybe you would do this too, but I think I would do everything I could ahead of time to try to minimize and mitigate conflict in our family, right? I'd be doing like family game nights all the time. I'd be telling my sons, okay, you're two brothers. You got to love each other. We'd be doing a lot of quality time, team building, on and on and on, because I wouldn't want conflict to kind of rise up to the top and, and wreak havoc in my family. But Isaac and Rebecca are kind of interesting because they don't seem to do anything to try to mitigate the conflict between these two boys. If anything, they do things that exacerbate the conflict between these two boys. Genesis 25, verse 27, the boys begin to grow up, and uh, Esau grows up, and he becomes a skillful hunter and a man of the open country. He's kind of a man's man, loves to go out hunting and fishing and all that stuff. While Jacob was more of a homebody, he was content to stay home among the tents. And then this, Isaac, the dad, he had a taste for wild game. He was a man's man too, so he loved Esau. But Rebekah, well, Jacob was kind of a mama's boy. He was a homebody. And so Rebekah loved Jacob. Okay, quick uh, child-rearing quiz 101 for you. Um, is it good to play favorites with your kids? Yes. Or no, the answer is, okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. You got that right. Um, but that's not what Isaac and Rebecca do. Isaac plays favorites with his oldest son Esau. Rebecca plays favorites with the younger son Jacob. And so now, not only do we have two brothers who are fighting with each other, we have two sons that are fighting for their parents' affection. And the conflict in this family gets bigger and badder. Well, all of this finally comes to a head one day when Isaac gets a little bit older, and Isaac, in his aged state, uh, develops a disability. Uh, we read about this in Genesis 27, verse 1. Isaac was old, and his eyes became so weak that he could no longer see. Now, here's the thing, not being able to see is a big deal if you live in an agrarian society because Isaac, as the father of the family, he would have also been the patriarch of this little people group, okay? And so they would have had a farm and they would have had sheep and cattle and goats and all of this stuff that he would have been responsible for, that he would have had to take care of. The problem that Isaac has is that it's really hard to take care of all of this stuff when you can't see any of this stuff. And so Isaac knows that he's getting long in the tooth. Isaac knows that he's not going to be able to do this for much longer. And so Isaac one day decides that he's going to call in his, his favorite son, his oldest son Esau, and have a little conversation with him. Genesis 27 verse 2, he says to Esau, um, I'm now an old man, and I don't know the day of my death, but I have a feeling it's getting close. So Go and get your equipment, your quiver and your bow. You're a hunter. Go put on your best camo. Go out into the open country. 
and hunt me some wild game. Prepare for me the kind of tasty food that I like and bring it back to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, there's a word that I want you to pick up on here. It's the word blessing. Because in this story with Isaac and Esau, this is kind of a technical term. In our day and age, right, we think of a blessing as something you get when you sneeze, right? You sneeze and somebody says, God bless you. Well, this actually goes a lot deeper than that. A blessing in this context, think of it like a legal bequeathment. So the idea is this. Isaac up to this point has been kind of the king of his castle. He's been the CEO of his family, okay? He's owned the cattle and the sheep and the goats and the land. He's had the money and the power and the house. But now Isaac wants to pass all of that down. He wants to bequeath all of that to his favorite son, Esau. And so he says to his son, Esau, all of this stuff, that we have, you can get from me. All you gotta do is go hunt some game that is tasty. And you can have the cattle, and you can have the sheep, and you can have the goats, and you can have the land, and you can have the home, and you can have the power, and you can have the money. You can be the king of this castle. You can be the patriarch of this people. You can be the CEO of this family. Now, if you're Esau, and all you gotta do to become the man who's large and in charge is go cook up your dad some dinner, what do you think you're gonna do? You're gonna go cook up your dad some dinner, yeah. And so Esau goes trotting off happily into the open country to hunt his dad some wild game, but there's, there's, there's a little problem. It turns out that somebody is eavesdropping on this conversation. Genesis 27, verse five, it's, it's Rebecca, Isaac's wife. She's listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. By the way, pick up on the pronoun there. Whose son Esau? His son Esau. Okay, let, let me ask you, technically, is Esau just Isaac's son? Is he just his son? Or is he Isaac and Rebekah's son? Is he their son? Technically, he's not his son. He's what? Their son. But the author of Genesis calls him his son. You see, the author of Genesis is picking up on this favoritism. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to, oh, look at this pronoun. Whose son? Her son, Jacob. Now, let me ask you the same question. Technically, is Jacob just Rebekah's son? Is he just her son? Or is he Rebekah and Isaac's son? Is he their son? Is he her son or their son? Their son. And yet the author of Genesis knows how deep this favoritism goes. His favoritism is bubbling to the top and boiling over. It's no longer just brother against brother. It's son against father, father against son, son against mother, mother against son. This family is in a hot, conflicted mess. And so Rebecca says to her son Jacob, look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you to. Go out to the flock, go out to the family pantry, go out to the family pen, and bring me two choice young goats so that I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. I know he he wants wild game, but he won't be able to tell the difference, okay? His eyesight is gone, his taste buds are gone, he'll like it, Just, just trust me, okay? And then, verse 10, take it to your father to eat so that he may give you Instead of your brother Esau, his what? His blessing, his bequeathment before he dies. Uh, Rebecca's concocting a a con here. Because here's the thing, if anyone is gonna get the family estate, if anyone's gonna become the new CEO of the family, Rebecca doesn't want it to be her least favorite son. Rebecca wants it to be her most favorite son. And so while Esau wants to give everything to Jacob, I mean, while Isaac wants to give everything to Esau, Rebecca wants to give everything to Jacob. And so Jacob goes out to the family pen, grabs a couple of goats, brings them back. His mother slaughters them, cooks up this delicious dish of goat goulash to bring to, to, to his dad. But Rebecca knows that she actually has to take this a step further. Because here's the thing, if, if Jacob goes in with his dish as Jacob, his father will never give him the blessing because Jacob is not his father's favorite. And so Rebecca doesn't just cook up this dish, 
She actually dresses Jacob up like, like his brother. She, she goes to his closet, gets his best camo, puts it, on, puts it on Jacob. And then she does something else that's really interesting. Uh, Genesis 27, verse 16, she covers his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins from the goats that she just slaughtered. Now, here's why she does this. Um, Esau's defining physical feature was that he was a very hairy person. In fact, in Hebrew, the name Esau means hairy, not like the name H-A-R-R-Y. I mean the hairy, H-A-I-R-Y. And so Esau had hair everywhere. Jacob did not. And so not only, not only does Rebecca dress Jacob up like his brother, she actually changes the very nature of his skin. She makes it kind of hairy, just like his brother, and then she sends him in to his father. And when Jacob goes into his dad, Genesis 27, verse 18, the very first thing that his dad says, the very first question that his dad asks is this, who is this? By the way, keep track of that question. It'll become important just a little bit later. But Isaac asks this question because Isaac doesn't know. Isaac doesn't see And so he just has to respond trustingly. He says, who is this? And here's where the con begins. Jacob says to his father, well, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you've told me. Please sit up, eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Then Isaac says to Jacob, um, come near me so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. You can see that Isaac's just a little suspicious here. He can sense that something is a little off here. But this is where the disguise really pays off. Verse 22, Jacob goes close to his father Isaac who touches him. And he says to him, well, your voice sounds like the voice of Jacob. But those hands, your skin, that's all hairy, just like the hands of Esau. And so Isaac did not recognize him so he proceeded to do what? He proceeded to bless him. To bequeath to him everything. All the cattle, all the sheep, all the goats, all the money, all the land. The house, the power, the status of CEO of the family. Now, when you stop to think about it, this is a pretty clever con, don't you think? But of course, the trouble with a con like this is that it's only going to last so long because eventually, who's going to come back to his dad? Esau. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. About the time that Jacob is leaving the room, Esau is entering the room. And he says to his dad, okay, dad, I made you dinner. And they both discover that they have been duped. And neither one of them are happy about it, but Esau especially is really angry about it. Genesis 27, verse 41, Esau says, I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. And that prophecy and answer to a prayer that God gave to Rebekah all those years ago is coming to pass. These brothers are in conflict so bad at this point that they literally want to resauce each other. They, they want to crush each other. They, they want to kill each other. This family conflict has turned into a complete catastrophe. Does your family ever struggle with conflict. You know, I hope um, that your family conflict is not as bad as the family conflict between Jacob and Esau and Isaac and Rebecca, but who knows, in a room this size, it might be families get awfully angry at each other sometimes. But even if it's not quite as bad, every family struggles with conflict. And so in the time that we have remaining in this message, I just want to ask a question, and the question is this, what do you do when family conflict comes for you? I got one point for you today, okay? Just a bottom line. If you write down one thing from this message, write this down. Here's the one thing I want you to try to do when family conflict comes for you. I want you to try to resolve that conflict 
by going and having a kind conversation about that conflict. Let me say this again. I want you to go and try to resolve that conflict by having a kind conversation about that conflict. Now, here's the reason I'm only giving you one thing today, okay? Um, This one thing, if you try to do it, you might just find that it's really, really, really hard. Uh, Think about it like this. Raise your hand if you love conflict, okay? You just want to dive into the middle of every conflict you see. Is there anybody like that? Every once in a while, there's somebody like that, okay? But raise your hand if you're more like me and you're not big on conflict conversation. You're bigger on conflict avoidance. Does anybody do that? It's okay. You can be honest. I do the same thing too. Here's kind of the way that we often live, right? It's almost like rather than having a conversation, we just want to pretend like everything is okay in hopes that eventually the conflict will just go away. But especially in your family, how often does that really work out? Now, I'll tell you what, this is, this is what Jacob and, and Rebecca do. When, when Rebecca finds out that Esau wants to kill Jacob, Rebecca freaks out. And so Rebecca goes to her favorite son, Jacob, and, and, and she says to him, okay, we, we got to get you out of here. Uh, Genesis 27, verse 43, we got to get you to flee. Go at once to my brother Laban and Haran. Go to your uncle Laban. He, he's a fun guy. And just stay with him for how long? A few days. A few days until your brother's anger subsides. Just run away, and eventually, in a few days, everything is going to be okay. That's what Rebecca says to Jacob. Because eventually, he'll simmer down and cool down, and this will all be fine, right? Well, actually, not not quite. Because here's what really happens. A few days turns into a, a few weeks. Turns out Esau was a little angrier than they first thought. And a few weeks turn into a few months, and a few months turn into a few years, in a few years, actually turns into a decade. In fact, by the time that Jacob decides that it's finally time to leave his uncle Laban's house, when he's saying goodbye to his uncle Laban, he says to him in Genesis 31, verse 38, I've been with you for how long? 20 years now. A few days turns into 20 years. Now, in those 20 years, Jacob has managed to accomplish a lot. He's managed to get married twice to two of his uncle Laban's daughters. Polygamy was kind of a socially acceptable thing back then. It's not a morally acceptable thing, but back then it was a socially acceptable thing. He has, count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven sons during this time. And he also has a daughter. He's done a lot in 20 years, but there's one thing that he has not done in 20 years. He has not had a conversation about the conflict that he's in with his brother. And so that conflict has never been resolved. It's still hanging out there. And Jacob knows it's time. He has to go and have this conversation. And so he he leaves his uncle Laban's house and he schedules this time to talk to his brother. And when the two see each other for the first time after 20 years, the scene is actually quite moving. This is uh, Genesis 33, verse 4. When Esau sees Jacob, Esau runs to meet Jacob, and he embraces him, and he throws his arms around his neck, and he kisses him, and the two of them weep. It's almost like they can't bring themselves to hate each other anymore, so they just have to love each other. But then verse 5, this is what I think Um, to be one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Esau looks up. And there with Jacob are these women and these children. And look at the question that Esau asks. Who are these with you? Esau doesn't know. Because it's been 20 years. Esau doesn't know that he has two sisters-in-law. 
Esau doesn't know that he has 11 nephews. Esau doesn't know that he has a niece. Esau doesn't know. Think about all the things that these two brothers have missed in 20 years. They've missed weddings, and they've missed births, and they've missed birthdays, and they've missed holidays, and they've missed celebrations, and they've missed celebrations with parties, and they've missed all sorts of memories that they could have been making for each other, all because of a dumb conflict. And I got to ask, was it worth it? I mean, really. For these two brothers, was that worth it? Now, here's where this gets very relevant and very hard for us because maybe you're in a conflict and maybe it's drug on and on and on and on. Maybe for a few days, maybe for a few months, maybe for a few years. Let me ask you the same question. Is it worth it? I mean, really? Do you want to miss out on your family? Do you want to miss out on your life? If it's not worth it, then it's time to have a conversation. Like Jacob and Esau. You can pick up the phone and make a call, or you can pick up the phone and shoot him a text. You can schedule a coffee. You can write him a note. Just do something, do anything to get a conversation going because it's not worth it. It's not worth it to keep a conflict going. Now, I know, I know that there are at least a few people in this room right now who are thinking to themselves, Zach, you you don't get it. You don't understand, okay? The conflict that I'm in right now with a member of my family right now, if I was to try to go to them, they'd get angry at me and they'd criticize me and they'd make fun of me and they'd yell at me. Here's the thing, that, that might happen. That is true. I can't predict the future. But is it worth it to at least give it a try? To at least make an attempt at having a conversation for the sake of your family? If you can't quite bring yourself to have a conversation about a conflict that you're in, then then let me give you something else to try, okay? Let me give you something else to do. Just do what Jacob does the night before he goes to meet with his brother. Because Jacob and Esau schedule this, this conversation, and the night before Jacob goes to meet with his brother, he's, he's really nervous about this conversation because we know the ending is happy, but Jacob doesn't know that yet, right? He doesn't know if his brother is going to embrace him or try to shoot him with his bow and arrow. And so Jacob is all stressed out, and so he goes away by himself for a little while into the middle of nowhere, leaves his whole family behind, and just goes away by himself to kind of mull the conversation that he's fixing to have over in his mind again and again. And maybe you've done this too. If you get ready to have a contentious conversation, what do you do? You think to yourself, okay, if they say this, then I'm going to say that, and if they say that, I'm going to say this. You plan the conversation out in your mind. You rehearse it again and again. That's what Jacob is doing. And he does it to the point of exhaustion. He, he falls asleep by himself in the middle of nowhere. But then in the middle of the night, he's awoken by a stranger who comes to him from nowhere. And the stranger seems to have it in for him. Genesis 32 verse 24, there's this man, and Jacob doesn't know who he is, but this man wants to wrestle with Jacob until daybreak. You know, it's a funny thing. Jacob has been running away from conflict for, for 20 years now. And yet conflict always seems to run after him, doesn't it? There's this guy who wakes Jacob up out of a dead sleep and starts wrestling with him. But here's the thing. Jacob, he may have been a mama's boy, but he's still pretty scrappy. Because he can actually pin the man down. Uh, Verse 25, when the man saw that he could not overpower Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And so this stranger begins to fight dirty. He actually dislocates Jacob's hip. But Jacob is so scrappy that even with a dislocated hip, he still manages to pin the man down and hold the man down. So the man cannot get away. So that in verse 26, you know what the man finally says? He says, uncle, let me go, he says. For it is daybreak. 
But Jacob replies, I will not let you go unless you what? Bless me. Now, this is already a strange story, but it's at this point where this strange story gets even stranger, because think about this. There is this man, this stranger, who's come from the middle of nowhere, who's woken Jacob up out of a dead sleep to try to wrestle him, fight him, kill him, pin him to the ground, and when Jacob turns the tables on him, rather than running away from the man, he asks for a blessing from the man. Now, why in the world would Jacob ask for something like this? In fact, why in the world would Jacob need anything like this? Remember, he got a big blessing 20 years ago from his dad. He got the cattle, the sheep, the goats, the land, the house, the money, the car, the power, the title CEO of the family, big man on campus, and king of the castle. He got it all from his dad, and as soon as he goes back, he can have all of that. So why in the world would Jacob ask for a blessing from a guy he's never met before? He doesn't need one of those. Well, the only thing stranger than Jacob's request is the stranger's answer to Jacob's request of this stranger, if you follow that. Verse 27, here's how the man responds to Jacob's request. Who is this? Does that sound familiar? Like, from a conversation that Jacob has with his dad 20 years ago. Where he goes into his dad to try to steal a blessing. And the very first thing that his dad asks in Genesis 27 verse 18 is, is who is this? And Jacob says to his dad, well, this is Esau. I'm Esau. You see, Jacob knows that um, if he wants a blessing from his dad, he's not going to be able to get it as Jacob. He has to pretend to be somebody else. He has to pretend to be the son that his father really loves. And Jacob's been carrying that around for 20 years now. And so what Jacob wants, what Jacob is looking for, what Jacob is desperate for is a blessing that actually belongs to him. And so back to Genesis 32, this man says to Jacob, who is this? And Jacob has a choice to make. Is he going to continue the con or is he going to tell the truth? This time, he says, I'm Jacob. This is Jacob. And I need a blessing for Jacob. To which the man responds in verse 28, okay, here's your blessing. Your name will no longer be Jacob. It's going to be changed to Israel. Because you've struggled with God and with humans. And you've endured. You know, Jacob knew a thing or two about struggling with humans. He'd been doing that all his life, right? Struggle with his dad, struggle with his brother, struggle with everybody. But now, here in Genesis 32, Jacob has a different struggle. He has a struggle with, with, with God. In fact, his new name, Israel in Hebrew, it literally means one who struggles with God. Because that man that Jacob was wrestling with on that night, it turns out that he wasn't just a man. He was God come to be with the man Jacob. And Jacob finally gets it. He finally sees it. He finally recognizes it. He says in Genesis 32, verse 30, you know what? I think I just saw God face to face. And yet, my life was spared. God could have pulverized Jacob if he wanted to. But God didn't. 
Here's what Jacob does the night before he goes to have a conversation with his brother Esau. He struggles with God. But when he struggles with God, he also gets a blessing from God. Because God throws a fight. God calls uncle. Because God wants Jacob to know that he is at peace with him. And that truth, that blessing, that reality is what gives Jacob the strength to go the very next day and try to make peace with his brother. So, if you don't feel like you can have a conversation with someone that you're in conflict with, just do what Jacob did. Struggle with God. Go ahead. Struggle with him in prayer. Give him all your reasons you don't want to do this. You don't want to have the conversation. But be careful. Because if you have that kind of a struggle with God, you might just get a blessing from God. He might just remind you that you don't need to struggle because you are at peace with him. And then he might just invite you to go and try to make peace with someone you're in conflict with. A couple of days um, after I put the uh, line of tape on my bedroom floor, I I walk in one day and the line of tape is gone. And uh, when I saw the line of tape was gone, I was fit to be tied because, you know, I had this grand plan to keep my brother on his side and and me on my side. And so I do a little bit of an investigatory work and and I go to my parents because I knew they were not very happy about my plan with the masking tape down the middle. And I say to them, hey, uh, did you pull up this tape? And my parents said, no, we didn't. I went to my sister. I knew she hadn't done it, but I asked her anyway. And I said, hey, did, did you pull up this tape? And she said, I don't even know what you're talking about. So by the process of elimination, I had figured out who had done it. And so I go to my brother. And I am over the top furious. And I say, hey, why did you pull up that tape? And he said to me, well, I promise. I'll keep all my stuff on my side. You can keep all your stuff on your side. That wasn't good enough for me, okay? I wanted a fight. So I ask him again, why would you pull up that tape? And I'll never forget how he answered. He finally just looked at me and said to me, um, I just didn't want to fight with you anymore. You know, uh, when it comes to our relationship with God, sometimes it's like we've put a line of tape between heaven and earth, between God and us. And uh, we're frustrated with God about something or we're frustrated with somebody else about something. And so we say to God, God, you stay up there and we'll stay down here. But then God does something. It's actually expressed beautifully in this verse from Romans 5, 10. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. While we were God's enemies, in other words, while we were fighting with God, while we were wrestling with God, while we were in conflict with God, we were actually reconciled to God through the death of his son. And here's what God does. He sends his son. And when Jesus comes, he just pulls up the line of tape between God and us, between heaven and earth. And boy, do people get mad about that. They yell and they scream and they throw fits. They even cry out things like, crucify him. And they mock him and they spit on him and they nail him to a cross. And I suppose Jesus, if he wanted to, could have come back and pulverized us, but he cries uncle. He throws the fight. And here's why. He just doesn't want to fight with you anymore. The cross is God's message 
that he is at peace with you. He's pulled up the tape. So now here's the question, how about you? What are you gonna do? Are you gonna pull up the tape? Are you gonna go and have that conversation with someone you're in conflict with? Let me end with just a little challenge. It's really more of an invitation. And if you try it, you might just find out that it's a blessing. Here's the challenge or the invitation. You go first. You pick up the tape first. You make the phone call, you send the text, you write the note, you schedule the coffee. Come on. You want to waste 20 years on a piece of tape? Life is way too short. Your family is way too important. So, you go first. And when you do, you might just be amazed at the blessing that you see. And besides that, you know this. When it comes to conflict, Jesus went first for you and for me. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, uh, yeah, conflict is tough. And it overwhelms us and it hurts us and it frustrates us. Thank you. When we were your enemies, you sent Jesus for us to reconcile us to you. Heavenly Father, we pray that we would take what you have done for us and use it in our relationships with others. And we ask this earnestly in Jesus' name. Amen. Now as you leave this place, remember, um, hey, you're at peace with God, okay? He's torn up the tape. And because of that, you're blessed. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. And now take that peace, share it around and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out God's precious word of life. Amen.